I'm Becky L. McCoy, and you're listening to Stories of Unfolding Grace, the podcast about grace during unexpected times. You'll hear from real people dealing with hard stuff, and I hope you'll feel encouraged that you can bravely live through hard stuff, too. about their family's adoption story and her son's diagnosis with autism. I'm here today with Adrian Terrebone, and why don't you share with us a little bit about your uh, challenging season? Okay, well, I'll start back in 2007. My husband and I had been married for about eight years, and we had a daughter who was about three, And we wanted to add to our family, so we um, had to do fertility treatments to get pregnant with our daughter, and so we went back to our specialist to do that again. But as we were doing the treatments, we just really felt like the Lord was calling our family to adopt a baby instead of getting pregnant and having a baby that way. So, and honestly, I had really already felt that way even before we had gotten pregnant with our daughter I felt like God was had told us one you know one day you will adopt a baby Mm -hmm. so we decided to put the fertility treatments on hold and we started the adoption process and we were going to adopt a baby from Guatemala we had done all of our paperwork paid all of our fees and we're on a waiting list just really waiting to get the phone call to go and get the baby. Mm -hmm. And instead, we got a phone call that said that the United States had stopped the adoption process with Guatemala. Uh, So, yeah. Terrible. It was was horrible. It was was devastating for us because we just had all of our eggs in this one basket. You know, we just really felt like that was where God had led us, and we couldn't understand why all of a sudden this wasn't going to happen, and we lost all of our money. and. Mm. So we were just sort of in a wait and see mode, like, what what do we do next? And then um, a few months later, we got a phone call asking if we wanted to adopt a baby from Ukraine. So, of course, we jumped on that and did all of our paperwork. And, again, just wait, we're waiting. And that fell through as well. There was some unrest over in that part of the world Mm -hmm. with Ukraine and Georgia and Russia and everything. So, anyway, that fell through as well. So by this time, it had been like a year and a half, and we'd had two adoptions fall through, and my husband was like, okay, we're obviously this is not what God wanted for us, for our family. <laughs> yeah, yikes. So we, he's <laughs> like, we're done. Um, and he's in the Air Force, so we were stationed in Louisiana at the time. So we got orders to move to Tennessee. And when we moved to Tennessee, I just begged my husband to let us do a home study there just in case, you know, God had a baby for us there, we would be ready. Right. And I remember him telling me, no, like if God wants us to adopt a baby, he's going to drop one in our lap. Mm -hmm. So I was pretty frustrated with that response because, I mean, that's not typically how adoptions work, obviously. Right. (laughs) Um, And every day I would just get up and I would pray for a baby. Like it, it sort of, you know, became an obsession for me, I think. And so one morning I was in my room, it was the spring of 2010. So by this time it had been over three years where we had been, you know, thinking about adoption and mm-hmm. I was in my room praying and I just felt like the Lord impressed upon me that I needed to stop praying for a baby. And I couldn't understand why he had asked mm-hmm. me to do that. Other than the fact that, I mean, it really had become an idol to me, I guess. And so I just gave it up to him and I said, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm going to stop praying for another child. I mean, we have one daughter, I'll be happy with her. Mm -hmm. So things, you know, we got into a little routine there in Tennessee and then my husband ended up deploying for a year. And so it was just me and my daughter and things were going good. Um, and then and let's see, on September, in September of 2010, so just a few months later, I was sitting in my room. I was reading the book Radical by David Platt. Mm-hmm. And I just, I don't know if you've read that book, but it's pretty yeah. like life-changing. <laughs> yeah. 
But I, I was reading it, and I just felt like the Lord just said, Adrian, how can I ever be glorified in your life if you're the one that plans everything? And obviously, I didn't hear an audible voice from the Lord, but I just felt Him impress that on my spirit, you know. And I think as moms, we are planners. I mean, I think mm-hmm. that's kind of in our nature. And and I certainly am. I want to know what's going to happen next week and next month. And yeah. So when I, when I felt that, I just felt like, okay, God, I don't, I don't want to be a planner anymore. I want you to show up in such a way that everybody sees it's you and not me. I don't want anybody to think... Oh, look what Adrian did. You Mm -hmm. know, I want them to see what God has done in my life. So I prayed that prayer on the morning of September 24th. And that very night, I got a phone call from our social worker back in Louisiana that we had not spoken to in over a year. And she called to tell me she had a baby, a birth mom who was having a baby. And they wanted our family to be the family for the baby. My word. Well, it was, I mean, crazy. So like they were in Louisiana, this family? Yes, okay. yes. The, the birth mom was in Louisiana. That's where we had lived before. Right. So, um, yeah. So we didn't even know that our social worker was still showing our information to anyone. I mean, we had moved out of state right. <laughs> like a year before, and um, and we didn't have any money because we had lost it all yeah. on those other two adoptions. Uh, Peter was deployed for the year. Oh, my goodness. You know, so he couldn't do any paperwork. And I told our wor- our social worker that, you know, we – I don't see how this can happen. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, how is this really going to happen? You know? Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, she just said, if the Lord wants the child to be in your family, he's going to make a way. Yep. So, and it's obviously that was true. A month later, our little Jonah was born. And so my daughter and I got in the car and we drove nine hours to Louisiana and oh I got to go to the hospital and be, meet his birth mom and her mom and I got to bring him home. So, wow. you know, that was, it was a crazy whirlwind. And then um, seven months later, Peter came home and was able to, we were able to be a little family of four. And we just thought, okay, this is great. Everything, this is how God wanted it to be. And then on Jonah's first birthday, we found out I was pregnant, which was a shock <laughs> because we were never supposed to be able to get pregnant. Right. So we had a little girl, um, Vivian, in the summer of 2012, and then six weeks later we moved to Georgia for Peter's job. And so when we moved here to Georgia, um, we didn't know anybody, and it was just a really hard season for our family. Vivian, bless her, she um, cried a lot and wouldn't sleep and wouldn't eat, and she, you know, just... I hate to say it, but a difficult baby. Mm. And so I wasn't sleeping. And then we started noticing some things with Jonah. Um, He was two, uh, around two at the time that we moved here. And um, he didn't start talking until after he turned two. He wouldn't look people in the eye whenever they would talk to him. The way that he played with his toys, it was, you know, just strange. He wouldn't really play with his toys. He would just sort of inspect them and... And then he tantrums all the time, like hmm. 11 tantrums a day, you know. Wow. It was, and, you know, two-year-olds, they throw tantrums. and Right. So some of that was to be expected, but just the amount of tantrums, it you know, was not typical of a normal two- and three-year-old. Mm-hmm. So my husband and I started kind of throwing around the word autism with each other, and, um, you know, we would tell some friends, oh, we think Jonah might have autism. And they would say, oh, no, 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 he's just a boy. He's just a two-year-old boy. And so we just kind of tossed this around for a little bit and ended up taking him for an evaluation. And a couple weeks before he turned three, we met with the psychologist, and she told us that he did have autism. And so, you know, we had kind of sort of already prepared our heart for that and kind of tried to wrap our minds around it. But when you actually see that diagnosis on paper, I mean, Mm -hmm. it was, it was devastating for our family. It, it felt like sort of like, I don't want to sound like overly dramatic, but sort of like something had died. I mean, our dreams for this child had died Mm -hmm. with this diagnosis. So it was just a really hard season for our family. How did you react emotionally to that? 
my husband and I cried a lot. Yeah. <laughs> we cried a lot. We, you know, I mean, we had questions for the Lord. Of course, we we knew that God had put Jonah in our family. I mean, there were so many things that had happened leading up to his adoption, and we just knew that he, Jonah was supposed to be in our family. But mm-hmm. at the same time, we questioned why would this happen? You know, so I think it was just really, it was a time of grief and sadness. And, and some days I felt like a normal mom with normal kids mm-hmm. and everything was fine. And then other days I just had so much anxiety and fear of the unknown, you know, what was going to happen. But for me personally, I just had to lean on the Lord. And that's not always my typical response in a, in a situation, you know, in a hard situation. But I knew that God was the only, only thing that was going to be able to get me through. I mean, mm-hmm. my husband and I, we had a really good communication, but we were both dealing with it together. Yeah. So it was hard to, to help each other, you know? So I knew that God was the only, the only thing that was going to help me get through and, well, and figure out what to do. How did you react, <clears throat> uh, like, emotionally? What was your emotional reaction to two adoptions falling through? Oh, devastation. Yeah. It, yeah, I mean, just complete devastation and we had told everybody you know right. we're gonna adopt from guatemala and yeah, then that fell so through and so then people yeah people would ask like what happened and we'd have to go through the story again uh, you know it's sort of like a almost like a miscarriage you know yeah, you announce sure. you're pregnant and then yep. you have to go back through that grief again and Never the same mind. thing with our yeah 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 uh, so so when we adopted Jonah, we didn't tell anybody. Like, yeah. You know, we told our family. Right. And then actually two days before he was born, I told our Sunday school group, our Sunday school class. Uh-huh. And that was it. Like, we had not told anybody up yeah. until then. So I just didn't want to have to explain it. Again. You know, yeah. If, it, if something happened. Yeah. Right. What did you struggle with most going through the infertility and adoption season, but then also with Jonah's diagnosis, and how do you feel like you handled the situations? Mm. Well, the infertility, particularly um, with our oldest, you know, all of my friends were getting pregnant at the same time that I was trying to get pregnant, and so that was a that was really really hard for me. I couldn't. It was hard. Some I was happy for my friends that were having babies. And I would celebrate with them and go to baby showers. But at the same time, inside, I was so sad for myself and Mm -hmm. wondering, you know, will will we ever have a child? And so it was, it was, that is always, has always been a struggle, I think. Um, With the autism, I mean, it was sort of expected, but but at the same time, just a complete devastation for our family because we didn't know what this was going to mean for our family. What, mm-hmm. what kinds of things would we be able to do now as a family if, if he continues with this severe autism that he, you know, we just didn't know what his future looked like. And so that made us fearful in a way because you, like I said, I'm a planner and I want to sort of be able to plan what's coming next. And with that diagnosis, it was hard to know, will he ever get better? You know, will, Will he be able to go to school and function normally? Will he have friends? It was just hard. Mm. It was hard because all of those fears came in. Yeah, for sure. I get so excited to see people choosing to live bravely and authentically. Each week on Tuesdays and Fridays, I host a Facebook Live event to share more stories of people living bravely, and I want to hear your story too. Join us at facebook.com backslash Becky L. McCoy. only share so much with you here on the podcast, but you can read my story and learn more about living bravely and authentically at my blog, beckylmccoy.com. Stop by and sign up to receive my monthly newsletter. It includes book recommendations, 
and blog posts and podcast episodes you may have missed. Check the show notes for details. I use this definition of grace as being good things that happen during difficult times. How would you say that over the last how just about 10 years have you seen good things happening even when when it's really hard yeah well I mean God is just he's just faithful you know there's no other way to say it he's just faithful he even when we can't see he's working behind the scenes and I think that's something that I can look back on and say now, Mm -hmm. but it's hard to say that, you know, when you're in the moment. Yeah, for sure. (laughs) Because it feels like, like, have you forgotten about me? Like I'm still mm -hmm. here, still treading water. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. But particularly when Jonah was diagnosed, we had a little life group at our church here. There's just a few families in our group and they were with us from the beginning, you know? And so they, saw our struggles and they were able to pray with us. And it was, you know, before we didn't know anyone here. And so to have just a small group sort of take us in and, and just know that they loved us and they were praying for us, that was definitely God's grace. And then whenever I got brave enough to post about Jonah's diagnosis, I wrote a blog post about it. Mm-hmm. Because I wanted people to see this is what we're going through. Maybe you're going through something similar. You know, this is how we're handling it. And I wanted people to be able to see that. And just the flood of emails and Facebook messages and texts from friends all over the country, really, you know, just encouraging me and saying, we're praying for you, or how can we pray for you? Uh, that was definitely God's grace, just giving us friends to encourage us and lift us up whenever we needed it. But I think probably the the biggest thing for me was Jonah was diagnosed in October of 2013. Well, in January of 2013, I had started doing a scripture memory challenge. Um, Beth Moore does it on her yep. blog every couple of years. Yep. And so I participated. Have you ever done that? Um, no, I have never actually participated, but I've seen that she okay. does it. Yeah. Yeah. So I've done it a couple times and that year was one of the years when she was doing it. So I had been memorizing scripture since January. So 10 months before he was diagnosed, 10 months before we even thought, you know, really thought about autism at all. And when I would choose a scripture, I would seek the Lord. I didn't just want to memorize any old scripture, you know, mm-hmm. So I would seek him and ask him to lead me to different scriptures. And he led me to so many scriptures like the Lord says, I will personally go with you and give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. Or the Lord will fight for you. You only have to be still. You know, all of these scriptures he led me to. And so when Jonah was diagnosed, I was able to fall back on those scriptures. Those are the things that flooded my mind. Not all the, you know, not necessarily all the fears. I mean, I did have fears for him, but... But I could, I didn't have to dwell on my fears. I could dwell on God's truth. And I could remember, okay, you know, we are God's masterpiece. Jonah is God's masterpiece and he has a plan. You know, I could mm-hmm. remember all these scriptures. So I feel like God is so faithful to prepare us for things that are coming that we don't even know are on our radar. You know, I mean, if we are walking with the Lord and it's hard to walk with the Lord when things are going good, you know, but when we are and when we're seeking him, he can prepare us for something bad that's going to happen. And I think that for me was his grace, just giving me his truth so that I can dwell on his truth and not my truth, because my truth is not always truth. (laughs) Right. So, I mean, that was, that was the biggest takeaway for me, just God's faithfulness in preparing me for something. How do you feel like you've, lived bravely and authentically as a result of all of this? Hmm. How have I lived bravely? I think just learning to be authentic, honestly. I mean, you know, growing up and even into young adulthood, I want, I wanted everyone to think I was perfect and my life was perfect. My husband is perfect. You know, I wanted Mm -hmm. everybody to think life is good. It's perfect. There's nothing wrong with me. And so learning how to say, oh, this is what I'm struggling with today. 
you know, can you pray for me? Or writing a blog post about something about Jonah's autism or about some fears we have or anything like that. Just learning to be authentic and sharing it with other people Mm -hmm. because, when we share that authenticity with others, then they can either come alongside us and and help us, or they can see, oh, they're not really perfect. I'm struggling with that too. You know, they can identify with us. Yep. So, I think just learning to step out and say, okay, really, I do have struggles. <laughs> yeah. And it's okay. We all have struggles. What would you say to encourage someone else who has gone through any of the things that? that you've struggled with, with the infertility or with the adoption issues, with having a child with a difficult diagnosis, how would you want to encourage Mm them? Mm. I think with infertility, I mean, oh, I have so many friends that have struggled with that and it is just a hard road. And I would say to, to that person, it's okay to be sad for yourself. You know, it's okay to, to, to celebrate with your friends and then go and cry in your bedroom. I mean, sometimes you just have to do that. Mm -hmm. And so that was something that I didn't, I felt guilty for that when I was struggling with infertility. I felt guilty that I was sad for myself and I felt like I was not, that was not how God wanted me to be. But I think it's okay to mourn. I think there's a season for that, of course. And so, you know, just, and that goes with anything. I mean, with Jonah's diagnosis, I mean, if you have a child that's diagnosed with autism or with any type of special needs, you have to mourn that. It's okay to cry about it. And I think that that's important to do. It's part of the process of grief. And so, you know, that is something that I always tell people. I'm praying for you, and it's okay to be sad. And the important thing is, Seek the Lord when you can. You may not want to um, at first, but seek the Lord when you can and find a support group that can help you. I mean, you may have really great friends, but they don't know what you're going through. Mm -hmm. So it's important to find a support group who can help you and come alongside you and maybe give you direction of what you need to do to help your child. So um, for us, we had a support group here on the base that they were able to sort of guide us you know, what type of therapies we needed for Jonah and Mm -hmm. what was going to be beneficial for him. So just being able to find others in your situation and, and learn from them is important. That's really great advice because there are so many well-meaning family and friends that want to help and, you know, Google, this is what you're supposed to be doing. But to be able to sit down Mm -hmm. and talk with somebody who has walked that road is just, that's amazing. Right. Yes. It's, very it was it was very helpful for us wow well thank you adrian for sharing your family story i know um that all of these these challenges are things that people are facing and struggling with and and they will definitely be encouraged um before we say goodbye i just want to ask a couple fun questions for people to get to know you a little better okay so the first is what are you loving right now okay well i love to read so I read anything. Okay. And right now, right now, I'm reading Beth Moore's novel. Oh, yeah. Um, I've heard about this. The, yeah. I was a little nervous about it for her because, I mean, I love her as a Bible teacher, but I wasn't sure right. how the novel thing was going to go. Yeah. Um, but I, I really do again? like it. it. It's called The Undoing of St. Sylvanus. Okay. So, I mean, it's really good. The characters are quirky, but the storyline is really good, and it's set in New Orleans, and my husband's from New Orleans, so I think it's always fun to read about places yeah. where you've been or lived. So I've just really enjoyed it. I'm about halfway finished with that one. Um, but I also just recently read a book by Kimberly Williams Paisley. Do you know mm-hmm. who she is? Yeah, she was and, the the girl, the daughter and father of the bride, right? Yes, yes, one of my favorite movies. Uh I know, me too, I love that movie. (laughs) Uh, So she wrote a book, it was a memoir about her mom's struggle with dementia, and it's called Where the Light Gets In. Okay. And it was just a really honest look at, you know, how dementia affects the patient, but not only the patient, how it affects the family members Mm. and the caregivers. 
And I just thought it was a really great read. I mean, it was funny in parts and really sad or, or poignant in other parts. But I think it would be a good resource for any well for anyone who obviously has a, a you know a family member or knows someone who's going through that diagnosis. But it's just a really great read. Mm. I, I love to read memoirs, you know, and see how people deal with their struggles. And so. Yeah. It was it was really good and interesting, and she's got a lot of resources in the back of the book for, you know, for those who have family members who have been diagnosed with dementia. So wow, that's I don't great. know. That was that's really, really cool. Yeah, it was really good. Yeah, it was a good one. Huh? What is your favorite food right now? <laughs> well, I love chocolate, so anything chocolate. But it's fall here right now. Although in South Georgia, it's still like 90 degrees. Right. <laughs> but uh, I'm ready for fall weather. Uh-huh. But um, I love anything pumpkin in the fall. So my favorite thing to make right now are pumpkin spice muffins. Yeah. And they're like three ingredients and so easy. And my kids eat them. And, you know, they think they're eating something really yummy. Right. But it's sort of healthy at the same time. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. That's my favorite thing right now. Just pumpkin stuff. Awesome. I'll have to get the recipe from you and put it in the show notes so other people can trick their children too. It's so easy. (laughs) Awesome. Awesome. What are you doing to take care of yourself? Um, well, I'm trying to get back into the gym and running again. I took, I sort of took the summer off. Um, my husband had been deployed and he came home the beginning of the summer. And, and so we just sort of hung out as a family all summer and I didn't really do anything (laughs) but now that the kids are all back in school I can get back and get back to the gym and start running some more yep because I really I really do love it it's just making the time to do it oh I hear (laughs) you so that's the hardest Mm. part it is what are you doing to be brave I'm doing your podcast. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I'm sure. doing to be brave. Um, I, I mean, I like to write. I'm not a speaker, so this has been interesting but fun. Um, and also, as far as, like, the Jonah, just being an – I don't want to say advocate. I don't really like the word advocate. But being a diplomat for him mm-hmm. with his teachers and things like that, I've never had to do that before with any of my other kids. And so just going – he started kindergarten this year and, you know, just meeting with his teachers and, and letting them know things that trigger him and, Mm -hmm. and how they can help him. I mean, it's not something that you do naturally or that I do naturally. I don't go and try to advocate for my kids, but, um, learning how to do that, learning how to, to do that for him. And he's, He's doing great. He's in a regular kindergarten class and doesn't really need any assistance. And wow, he's come so far. It's just, I mean, it's just that's exciting for him. Frankly, a miracle. Yeah, yeah. it is. But just, I know I'm always going to have to be that advocate for him. Yep. You know. So and it, and learning to be okay with that. Mm-hmm. For sure. Well, thanks again, Adrian, for sharing your story with us. Thank you for having me. It's been fun. Make sure you subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. While you're there, please rate, review, and share Stories of Unfolding Grace. When you give it five stars, it goes a huge way in helping other people find the podcasts by increasing my ranking. If you're interested in sharing your own story of unfolding grace, head to my blog, beckylmccoy.com backslash submissions. I can't wait to hear from you. stories of unfolding grace is the very last episode of this first season i can't believe that it's gone by so quickly and we've shared so many stories i'm going to share my own story of this year and the podcast and writing and and the challenges and joys of all of that thanks again for joining me i'm looking forward to next week